open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. So I didn't know y'all were, y'all were, yeah, so children, you, you're dismissed at Children's Church. I didn't know that Amy was not feeling well, so I didn't know that y'all were taking her place. <laughs> what is your big, hairy dream for our church? In my first year as a pastor here, I was talking with a pastor friend of mine. I had some ideas. I was trying to run by him saying, hey, do you think this would work? Do you think this would work? And he's, he said, you just need to ask yourself, what's your big, hairy dream for the church? And I kind of laughed at that just from the terminology of big, hairy dream. But, um, but think about it. What's your dream for our church? We have a really great church. I'm so grateful to be the pastor here. Um, we're, we're, we're far from being an unhealthy or a dying church. Let, let's dream. What's next for us? If the sky was the limit, if there was no limit with money, people, or anything else, what's your dream for our church? I hear a lot about church growth from people, and when I'm involved in the Mel Association, the, the, George, the Georgia Baptist Mission Board, or the Southern Baptist Convention, church growth is something people um, hammer on constantly in those places. Um, it's one of the most common topics you'll hear pastors talk about when they're together. How many are you running? How many people are you running? And they ask me that, and I'm like, I, I mean, I, I know generally, but I don't, you know, I don't judge my success on how many people I'm running. Um, in the church world, church growth has often been defined in very business-like terms. It, you, you'll often hear pastors talk about how they're targeting the three Bs, increasing the three Bs, buildings, budgets, and butts. Grow your church to where you need a bigger building, Increase your giving so you have a bigger budget and get as many butts in the seats as possible. It's numerical growth. That's not the kind of growth I spend my time praying about for our church. Um, because we're not a restaurant. We're not a restaurant. We're a spiritual family. Our success is not found in how many customers we get in the door. In a family, we're a spiritual family. We're not a restaurant. So in a family, you're, you're certainly really excited when babies are born. Like, that's a, that's a wonderful moment, but that's not the key factor to define a healthy family by, by how many babies are born. So do I want more people to come to our church? Absolutely. Do I want you to continue to give so generously as you do? Absolutely. Do I want our church to grow in size and, and add some people through baptism and salvation? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's not my driving hope for our church. All of that is simply a fruit of something deeper. I want to share my prayer for our church for 2022 today. I want us to dream about what God could do among us next year and in the coming years through what he might do in us. What does God want for his church? What does God want for our church? I think we find that in Ephesians chapter 3 in a prayer that Paul prays for the church at Ephesus. It's the same thing he wants for every church. It's in Ephesians 3. I'm going to start in verse 14. I'm going to read through the end of chapter 3. For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Right out of the gate, Paul says something um, that, that we need to always remember. Our church belongs to God. Our church belongs to God. Mount Zion Baptist Church belongs to God. It does not belong to me. It does not belong to Brother Larry. It does not belong to the Thompson family or the Jones family or the Cromer family or the Griffin family or any other family represented here. It does not belong to the deacon body. 
It does not belong to whoever gives the most money or whoever's been here the longest or whoever had a relative that started the church generations ago. It belongs to God. He owns it. It's the treasured possession of Christ that he bought with his blood. Any human who thinks they own any church needs to ask the simple question, have I been stripped naked and nailed to a tree to bleed out every drop of my blood to purchase the church as my own? Because if they haven't done that, they don't own it. God owns our church. Therefore, we should always pursue what God wants for our church. That means we have to seek him about what he wants for our church. So ultimately, it doesn't matter what my big hairy dream for the church is. It's the question of what is God's big hairy dream for the church. Notice who this God is, verse, um, verses uh, 5, 15, 16. Actually, 14 through 16. First of all, he is father. He's a good father. If you didn't have a good father, understanding that God is a good father may be difficult for you. You only associate fathers with something negative. I'm so sorry that happened to you. That's not God's design for fatherhood. He delights to do the very best things for his children. He's like a father on Christmas morning that that has been a part of getting like this really great gift so that when his um, child opens it up, he he, he can see the delight on his child's face. Wow! God wants to do that for us, but but a million times more than a Christmas gift. He wants to do the very best things for his children. Not always what they want, but what he knows is best for them. Sometimes what is best for us is not what we want. God has the wisdom to know the difference. He takes great joy in doing the absolute best for his children, Uh, One one of my favorite writers, John Piper, has this famous quote, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you're probably only aware of about three of them. He's always doing 10,000 things in your life. You're probably only aware of about three of them. He loves you. He sings over you. He rejoices like a father with a newborn baby. This is who our God is. He's father, he's also creator. You see that line, he's who from every family in heaven and on earth is named in verse 15. Not only does he want to do great things with us and through us, he is the creator of all things. He was ultimately the creator of every person on this planet and every molecule in existence. That means he owns it all. Nothing is outside of his power. He controls and governs every piece of existence. It's his And thirdly, he's he's father, he's creator, and thirdly, he's limitless. He's limitless. You see, um, he he has riches in glory, verse 16. He has riches in glory. Not only does he love you and want to do incredible things in and through you, not only does he own the entire universe and and it makes him all-powerful, no, he has riches in glory. There is no limit on his bank account. He doesn't have to stop at Circle K and fill up his car. Like, he does not need to rest or sleep. He has all the resources of heaven and earth available to him and then some more. So if he loves you and wants to do incredible things in and through you, and if he owns everything in the universe, and if he has no limits on what he wants to do in and through you and in and through our church, what does he want for us? Well, Paul prays a prayer for this church in light of that. He prays a prayer for the church at Ephesus. It's what I think God wants for every church. And he asks for three things for the church at Ephesus. Um, and, and I think they're all tied together. That is, you can't have one of these things. You, you can't have one of them if you don't have all of them. If you, if you don't have one of these three, you, you don't have any of them because they're all tied together. They all build on one another. So what's he pray for? Well, First, he prays for spiritual strength, verses 16 and 17. Paul prays for spiritual strength for them. He wants them to be strengthened with power, strengthened with power, in verse 16. I'm praying that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So those three things, with power, through his spirit, in your inner being. So strengthened with power. When you hear power... It's easy for us to imagine something like epic, something big, something you can see. When I hear power, I picture like an atomic bomb, you know, mushroom cloud coming up. Or I picture, you know, that moment when, you know, Yoda lifts Luke's X-wing out of the swamp. Or when a, you know, quarterback runs an 80-yard touchdown. I picture something that you can tangibly see. This is powerful. We 
we picture something like that. But notice what this power is. It's spiritual. It's, in the, it's through the spirit. It's, it's spiritual. You can't necessarily see it. It's not something you can see and be blown away by necessarily. It's spiritual. It's in the inner self, so it's not visible to the outside. It's something that goes on inside of you that the eye cannot see. You may not be doing anything epic when you're using it, but it's going on inside of you. Spiritual power is the power to continue loving Jesus when it causes you to have a bad reputation among the people you know. Spiritual power is the power to continue trusting that God is good even when you are suffering tragedy. Spiritual power is the power to look at an enticing temptation and say, no. Spiritual power is the power to read, the Bible, to read a Bible passage and it give you supernatural joy that is unexplainable when, when, it's, when you think about the fact that it's just words on a page, but it's something more than that when you see it spiritually. It's not something you can see, but it's power. Strengthened with power by the Spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He strengthens and he sanctifies believers. Day by day, God is using his Spirit to grow you into conformity to the image of his Son. You have to walk in step with the Spirit for that to happen. You have to put off the flesh and live in the Spirit. You put to death the deeds of the flesh and you live in the fruit of the Spirit. And it's strengthened in the inner being, that is, in your heart, verse 17, that, that Christ may dwell in your heart. In the Bible, inner being and heart kind of coincide. When the, when the Bible talks about the heart, it's not referring to the organ in your body that pumps blood. It's something like the throne of your life, the center of who you are. It's where you place your deepest treasure in life. The heart is where you keep what you love. Spiritual power is found in your love for Jesus. It's found in your affection and in what you treasure, your affection, what you love and how it affects your life. There's a lot of people who say they love Jesus, but nothing in their life says so. Jesus could not exist and their life wouldn't change any. And then what you treasure, what is most valuable to you, what is your, of highest value to you will be apparent in what you do with your life. We need power. We need spiritual power because so many Christians are spiritually weak. We need spiritual power because uh, apart, by ourselves, we are spiritually weak. It's why it takes very little to get, um, to get you to deny commitment to Jesus and get me to deny commitment to Jesus. It's why we'd rather cast people aside who have wronged us than forgive them and work through those issues. It's why we, we can share something on Facebook that is completely not biblical, but it's a catchy statement, and, and so we share it. It's completely antithetical to the Bible, but wow, it's, it's such so good of words. It's why you can sit down and read your Bible, and it's so easy for your smartphone to call your name, and you listen to it. It's why sin is so enticing to us, and the beauty of Jesus is not satisfying to us. We need spiritual power, because apart from ourselves, just by ourselves, we are weak. I'm praying for spiritual power for our church. Why do we need spiritual strength? Why do we need spiritual power? Because of the second request. Second half of verse 17 through the first part of verse 19. Doctrinal depth. Spiritual strength, he prays that for the church. He prays doctrinal depth for the church. Notice the connection of the words. Strengthened with power through his spirit. This is verse 16. Through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Notice what he doesn't ask that would be strengthened to do. It's interesting. It's interesting that he doesn't say, you know, that we'd be strengthened with power to end poverty. Or that we'd be strengthened with power to baptize millions of people. Or to, um, you know, change the government or anything like that. No, it's strengthened to comprehend. Uh, continue following the line. Strengthened that, so that Christ may dwell in us so that we may comprehend his love. Strengthened with power to comprehend his love. Seems like a weak prayer, doesn't it? Uh, I, I know Christ's love. That's what we think. But, but notice all that he's talking about here. That we'd be rooted and grounded in love. It's not referring to love for each other in that line, although we should love each other. Love in this passage is all about the love of Christ. We're rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. 
That's an agricultural term, and that's an architectural term. Uh, agricultural, we'd be rooted in it. Uh, the roots are what give the plant life. If you uproot a plant from the ground, it dies. And then an architectural term, the foundation um, grounded. The, the foundation of a building is what's most important to it. If you don't build the foundation right, eventually the building will collapse. The foundation is what the building's built on. We, Paul wants the church to be rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus. Rooted in it. That is, our salvation is born from the gospel of Jesus Christ, from the love of Christ demonstrated at the cross on our behalf. If you uproot yourself from that love, you will wilt and die. You want to go deeper and deeper and deeper in that love. You want your roots to go down deep and deep and deep and then grounded in his love. The gospel of Jesus is what everything is built on. It's what everything's built on. If something in our church is not built on the gospel, why are we doing it? It's destined to collapse because it has faulty foundation. If something in your Christian life is not built on the gospel, it's going to collapse. Maybe the reason you do things in your Christian life is, well, I'm going to love and serve people to be a good person. That will collapse someday. Because what about those days when you don't feel like being very good? You know, there are plenty of days where I just want people to leave me alone. But the gospel compels me to put that attitude to death. Not my desire to be a good person. The gospel. We love and serve others because Jesus loved and served us. Because of the gospel. We work to fortify that foundation. So this whole process starts with a foundation of God's love in the gospel. Paul wants the church to then comprehend, verse 18, comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth, all the different directions of the love of Christ. That gospel message is certainly the message you believe when you're saved, but it's not that we believe that and then just you know, throw it to the side and move on to other stuff. No, all that God is can be found in the glory of the gospel. This is why Paul prays for strength that you may have the strength to comprehend all that the love of Christ is, every direction, how deep the love of Christ is, how wide the love of Christ is, how tall the love of Christ is, how long the love of Christ is. He wants you to grasp it all because God is an infinite God. He is unsearchable. He, the depth of his glory is incomprehensible. You will never learn all that there is to know about him. You won't. You plunge into the depths of who he is. Even after you get to heaven one day, you're not instantly going to be downloaded with everything there is to know about God. No, he's infinite. You will spend all of eternity getting to know God more and more. You will never in a million, million years learn all that there is to know about God. You'll always want more of him because he's an infinite God. So Paul prays that the church will have the strength to continue plunging into the depths of who God is found in the gospel and learn it more and more and more, going in every direction that we may. He says, verse 19, that we may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. He, he wants you to know what is impossible to know. He wants you to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Know something that is impossible to know. That's what he says. This is what we do. This is what the whole prayer of, that, that we're reading here hinges on. We're, we're, we're going to see how it connects in just a minute, but the whole prayer is ultimately that the church would know Christ deeper and deeper, that they would study him, that they would participate in his love. How well do you know Jesus? I have it many times since being pastor asked a person, can you tell me what the gospel is? And I can't tell you how many times I've been met with the answer of, I don't know. Multiple times. Let me give you a scenario. I approach you on the street. I've got a knife in my back. I've got 30 seconds to live. I don't know where I'm going when I die. What must I do to inherit eternal life? You've got 30 seconds. How would you answer that? Because if all you can tell me is Jesus loves you, you've got to believe in Jesus, I'm going to hell because the devil believes in Jesus. The devil believes Jesus loves people. 
No, in case you don't know the gospel, let me share it with you. God is an infinite holy God. Mankind has sinned against that holy God with our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. We deserve God's wrath for all of eternity as a, penal as a penalty for our sin, but God loves us and doesn't want that to happen to us, so he became a man named Jesus. He, he lived the life that we should have lived, and he died the death we deserved. On the cross, Jesus received the full effect of God's wrath as punishment for sinners. He rose again to defeat death and hell forever and now you must repent of your sins and believe in that sacrifice in your place on the cross and when you do this god forgives your sins grants you the righteousness of christ and gives you eternal life forever that's the gospel it's it's far more than you got to believe in jesus beyond that beyond knowing the gospel message how how well do you know jesus himself how well do you have a relationship with him? How well do you know his word? Doctrine is so important. We, we often you know, cater doctrine out to seminaries, and only seminary students have to learn doctrine. No, so many churches and pastors today have this really stupid idea that you don't have to study doctrine. Just love Jesus. Doctrine and theology don't matter. One time, Adrian and I introduced that song, His Mercy is More, to a worship pastor that we know. And we said, hey, you need to, this is a great song, you need to introduce this at your church. And he said, no, I don't think I'm going to do that because it uses the word omniscient. And people don't know what that word means. What? What? Teach them. You're a shepherd of the church. Teach them what omniscient means. Because they don't know and they need to know. You know, that, that stupid idea, you just love Jesus, you don't have to know doctrine. Aside from the fact that that completely ignores all of Christian history, it's foolish. Imagine if I told you, I love my wife. I love her blonde pixie haircut. I, I love the Asian slant of her eyes. I love her dark skin tone. I love how well she works day after day as she's the CEO of her business. I love when she drives around in her 1989 Cadillac. I love her lip ring. I love eating seafood with her. She really loves rainbow trout. All right, if you know my wife, you know none of those things about her are true. And if I were to tell you that, you would look at me and say, Aaron, I don't think you have any idea who your wife is. Exactly. So why is it that Christians think they can just love Jesus and never learn anything about him? Never learn anything about him. Plunge into the glory of doctrine. Learn more and more about the God that made you and the God who loves you. Don't settle for just reading a devotional book. Read devotional books, but go beyond that. Don't settle for just reading your Sunday school lesson. Read your Sunday school lesson, but go beyond that. Don't settle for just opening the Bible app on your phone and reading the verse of the day. No, plunge into the glory of the Bible. Spend time in it. And then read some really good books on doctrine and the Christian life. Do you know how blessed we are? Christians around the world don't have the entire Bible in their language, yet often they know God better than the American Christians do, who have ten translations leather-bound on their shelf that they don't read. We have endless volumes of glorious books that have been written to help us know our God. We have more theological resources available to us than any age in Christian history. Paul, Peter, and John did not have what we have. John Martin Luther and John Calvin did not have what we have. Jonathan Edwards and Charles Spurgeon did not have what we have. Billy Graham did not have what we have. We have so much, and there's no excuse for the biblical illiteracy of the, of the average American churchgoer. It's nothing but pure spiritual carelessness. Luke chapter 12, 48, listen to what Jesus says. Everyone to whom much is given, of him much will be required. Much has been given to us. So much is required of us. Paul prays that this church and any church would know God's love deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's my prayer for us as well. That we would have spiritual strength to know as much of God as we can possibly know. But we don't just learn more about Jesus to be better at Bible trivia. Or maybe to know the answer on Jeopardy from time to time. No, this isn't about learning and uh, learning of him and saying, well, that's interesting. I never thought of it that way. No, we learn more and more about Jesus that we may participate in his story in this world. 
Look at the goal of all this. It's the third request that Paul has for the church. He, he prayed that they would be strengthened with power, that they would have doctrinal depth, and third, that they would be full of God. Verse 19, that they would be filled up with all the fullness of God. That's the goal of all this. We learn more and more about Jesus. It's something like a, if I took a glass of water and set it in my sink, and I took the faucet, put it over the glass, turned the water on, and just let water come out into the glass. It's going to keep filling up and filling up and filling up, and eventually what's going to happen? It's going to overflow into the sink. Let's say I put the stopper in the sink. Well, then the sink starts to fill up, right, along with the cup. Eventually it's overflowing into my kitchen. I need to stop it at that point. But you get the idea. Notice the progression Paul prays for. He prays that we may have spiritual strength to be able to understand all of who God is so that we may be filled up with the fullness of God. That's his goal for the church. That's the main focus of this prayer, that they would know God more and more so that the goal might come, that they would be filled up with the fullness of God. We plunge into the depth of doctrine to know God more so that we might fill up with God and overflow to those around us. That's the goal. So if you cut either of those first two steps out, if you try to understand doctrine without spiritual help, or if you pray for spiritual health, but you don't use it to learn and know God more, you don't get to this point where you learn, where you fill up with the fullness of God. Paul prays that this church would be filled with the fullness of God, and I'm praying that for us as well. Notice, none of this that Paul prays for is about what the church does for other people. That's crazy, isn't it? This, this is all about heart work. This is all about something you do inside yourself. Why didn't Paul pray that the church would convert the entire pagan Ephesian culture? Why didn't Paul pray that the church would heal all the sick people? Well, why didn't Paul pray that the church would end poverty in Ephesus? Or that they would adopt all the orphans in Ephesus? Because none of that stuff is what the church does. God does that stuff through the church. God is the one who does that stuff. He does it through us. Do you see that here? Verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. What does he say there? To him that is able to do far more than we could ever imagine. How does he do it? Through the power at work within us. He does it through us. So... What's your big hairy dream for our church? God can do far more than that. He can do far more than that. Through the power at work within us. What power? Well, the power we've already been talking about. Verse uh, 16. The, The power that he strengthened us with to know him more and be filled up with his fullness that we may spill out of God to those around us. That's what he's saying. This is the message throughout the Bible. Mark 1.17, what's Jesus tell the disciples? Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. You learn to know the depths of who God is. He does the work through you of fishing for men. So this is my prayer for our church next year. Not that we would increase in buildings and budgets and butts, though I hope all those happen. True church growth is not just wider, it's deeper. It's deeper. If we're a mile, if a church is a mile wide but a quarter of an inch deep, they're useless. The, what, what is a puddle good for except stepping in on your way into Walmart? So my prayer in 2022 is that we would all pursue knowing God on an extremely deep level, knowing everything about him that we possibly can, and that that would translate into God working in through us in ways that we could never possibly imagine, that, that we could never possibly imagine. So we have to press on to know him. So what are some things you can do, some action steps? To be able to carry out this prayer, let me just give you a few. Commit to read your Bible all year. If you want, uh, I mailed it out with the newsletter for January or December. I mailed it out with the December newsletter. There's also some in the back. Uh, I do every year a church Bible reading plan. It's five chapters a week. I'm making a personal commitment that I'm going to regularly emphasize that plan from the pulpit, something I've failed to do in the past couple of years, so it's easy for you to forget about it. Read a chapter a day, write down your thoughts, and on the weekends, read something else in Scripture, or read a good book. That's the second one. Read good theological books on doctrine and the Christian life. If you'd like some suggestions on particular topics, come talk to me. Listen to other preachers. Disclaimer, other preachers cannot replace you being here. 
God has placed me as the pastor and shepherd to care for your soul. You can't get that from Matt Chandler, David Jeremiah, or Tony Evans because they don't know you. They don't know you. When I prepare my sermons, I'm thinking of you. I'm thinking of how this text is going to apply to our congregation. David Jeremiah is not doing that for Mount Zion Baptist. But listen to other preachers as well. Just fill your head with with the the word of God. Do it. As you go out today, there's going to be a resource sheet that I typed up to give you. On one side, it's got a list of book recommendations on all kinds of topics. Um, Christian life, marriage, parenting, theology, you name it. On the other side, it's got a suggested list of preachers. It's also got a Bible study method for you to follow on the side here. I've given you a couple examples of ones that I've done. It's called a Hear Journal. It's a very simple um, thing that you take through as you read a passage of Scripture. I've given you a couple examples of how I've done it in the past. Do studies on Right Now Media. In case you forgot that we have that, um, get your bulletin. There's a QR code if you have a smartphone. Scan that QR code. It'll give you a login for Right Now Media. There's all kinds of studies on it that you can take and, and learn to know God more. Fast and pray. Fast and pray. Take some time this coming year to commit that you're going to fast and pray. I'm planning four days over the course of the, of the year, every three months, that I'm going to get away for the day and just spend the day in prayer. Do something similar that works with your schedule. Commit to times of fasting for the purpose of seeking God. Sing. Make it a regular habit that you're going to sing songs of faith. You know, this morning, uh, one of you came in and they were practicing the music and you were singing the songs as you walk in. Awesome. Do that sort of thing. Sing regularly. Whether it's a hymn out of our hymnal or a gospel song or something on the radio, just sing. And plunge in deeper here than you are. Ask yourself the question, where am I lacking in commitment to the local church? What is a step I can take to to grow in that? I'm very excited for January as we do this Rediscover Church study. It's a book written for um, this time, post-pandemic. Get the book on the way out if you haven't gotten it yet. Um, The the sermons that I preach in January will be based around the topics of that book. From Scripture, dealing with the topics of what is a church— Will you commit to be here Sunday morning and Sunday evening for those four weeks? And we're going to talk about what the church is. And then commit to plug in and be more involved after that's over if you're not. I love the beginning of the year. It's a time of opportunity. Many of us set New Year's resolutions. I set New Year's goals. Um, The difference is resolutions, you start at the beginning of the year and you drop off by January 5th. Goals are something you're shooting for all year. Set New Year's goals. Anything is possible at the beginning of the year. I don't know what kind of goals you're going to make for the new year, how you're going to improve. Here's one for you. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. Make that your goal for the new year. Press on to know the Lord better through studying his word and studying doctrine. And let that fill you up with the fullness of God so that God might work through you in our church and in the world for the glory of his name until he comes again. Let's pray. Father, I pray this prayer for our church this morning that that Paul prayed for the church of Ephesus. Lord, I pray that you would grant us spiritual power through your spirit in our inner being. I pray that, we would, that, that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith, that we would be rooted and grounded in his love, and that we would have the strength to comprehend all, with all of the saints, with each one of us, what is the, what is the length and the width and the height and the, the depth of your love. To know that love, it surpasses knowledge, but Lord, help us to know it and fill us up with the fullness of God, that we may spill over like a, like a full cup in a sink to the sink around us. Lord, now... May you work through us. May you do far more abundantly than we could ask or think through that power working within us. And may that give you glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing.